Good evening, friends. It's lovely to see so many of you come as we gather together this evening, this evening of Good Friday, as we gather on that day when all around the world, millions of our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ will gather to remember the sacrifice of our Savior. Not at once for all sacrifice, which makes each and every one of us who believe and trust in him, brothers, sisters, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we gather this evening in remembrance. We gather this evening to share in, in bread and wine and that powerfully symbolic and very, very special way which Christ himself ordained to remember his sacrifice. We're going to begin our worship this evening by singing Beneath the cross of Jesus I fain would take my stand. <laughs> begs the question, why good? Until we recall that on that day, your sinless Son, our Savior, bore the punishment that was upon us. We thank you, Father, for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. 
And Father, knowing that you are the God who would not even withhold your own Son for those who you would call as your children, we come before you this evening knowing that everything our God does for us is good. Gracious Father, as we sing our praise, as we bring the worship, Father, from our lips and from our hearts, and as we come at the very summit, as it were, of our worship this evening too, to break bread and to remember. Father, may in the solemnity of that remembrance, may we share the joy of thanksgiving. For we have been redeemed. We bless you. We thank you for giving us your son and pray that all that is done this evening would be to your glory and to the praise of his name amen let's continue in praise we'll keep our seats as we sing how deep the father's love for us chapter 19 verses 17 to 42 the crucifixion 
Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fashioned to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them, and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother there, and this disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drinks, drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was a day of the, of the preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want his body left in the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. These things also happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and, as another scripture says, they will look on the one that they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Amen. Thank you, David. Before we turn our thoughts and attention to this passage of Scripture, 
We're going to sing together once more. Give me a sight, O Saviour, of thy wondrous love for me. We'll stand as we sing. to the reality of what was taking place that day. Yes, we know that our God is good. 
And this was good news. I want us to think for a little time this evening of, of some of the characters that we heard of in that reading of Scripture. The first 16 verses of John chapter 9 focus, 19 focus very much on, on Pilate. We, in a sense, in this reading, pick up in the final part of his dealings. It was, after all, the Roman governor who, to whom Jesus had been brought. It was the Roman governor who, in the end, would simply wash his hands of the whole matter. It was the Roman governor who, it may have seemed at one point, would have been happy to see Jesus released. <coughs> Until he was reminded by the Jewish leaders that were he to do so, he would be no friend of Caesar. And Pilate, the Roman governor, clearly prized friendship with Caesar. Greater than integrity to a man who was clearly without sin. Yet in this reading we, we read of his action in writing an inscription, placing it on the cross. Now, it, it, it was typical that, as it were, a a record of the charges against a crucified man would, would be placed on the cross. But what could Pilate write? He could not write of the sins of sedition or murder or whatever else. For, for he knew that the Jewish accusers brought no evidence of this man being worthy of death. So instead, he wrote Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. It was close by the city, and many read the inscription, an inscription written in Aramaic, and in Latin, and, and in Greek. Aramaic, after all, the predominant Jewish language at that time. Indeed, so many Jews had forgotten how to read Hebrew that the Old Testament had been translated into Greek for them, but Aramaic was the language that Jesus would speak. According to Jewish tradition, and it is only tradition, they believed Aramaic was the language that Adam would speak in the garden. But whether that was the case of the first Adam or not, it definitely was the case of the one who would be known in God's saving purpose as the second Adam. The one who would become and be obedient to his father. Aramaic then. Or Latin. The language of rule. Legal language. This was clearly a a statement of who this man upon the cross was. In Greek. Greek, the language of the thinkers, the, the philosophers. Friends, no one in Jerusalem could walk past that cross without knowing what Jesus claimed to be. No one. Of course, we read that the chief priests were not pleased. No, they, they wanted amended. They wanted amended to say, this man said, I am king of the Jews. <coughs> no, Pilate answered. <coughs> what I've written, I've written. Now, some say, does this reveal deep within Pilate's heart a, a sense that perhaps he believes himself Jesus is? Or is it perhaps the case, as I think more likely, <coughs> that Pilate was simply not prepared to allow these Jews who could be rebellious themselves to, to tell him what to do? 
No. No. What I've written, I've written. And it will remain there. Pilate. He wasn't there on Golgotha's Hill. The soldiers who were involved in the executions, they'd been there, and many others had, had come to see what was happening, but then we read of a small group. A small group were there by the cross. This group is comprised of Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene. Each in one way with lives deeply touched by this man who hangs upon the cross. Mary. <coughs> Mary thinking back more than 30 years to the events of what we call that first Christmas. <coughs> the message from the angel. <coughs> The growing awareness that she is with child of, of the Holy Ghost. And don't we always wonder what was in Mary's mind? You know, two songs come to mind. The, the very popular one written by Mark Lowry and the tune written by Buddy Green of Mary, did you know? Well, did Mary know? I'm sure we can discuss and, and debate that. Or one that Touches my heart more deeply, written by Greg Hendrick, Thorns in the Straw. And did she see there thorns in the straw? Even as the baby that she has just delivered in her arms, how could she know what lay in store? But here she is, she's at the foot of the cross. And we witness the most loving and trusting. John, that disciple who refers to himself in his gospel as the disciple whom Jesus loved. I know I've said this before. It's easy to think, well, that's a bit bold of me. Is it not right to think that Jesus loved all the disciples? Yes, Jesus did love all the disciples. Well, did Jesus have a favorite? No. As I've said before, and you may well have said, heard me say, I can't help but wonder if what is in John's mind when he writes the disciple whom Jesus loved is the reality that he could never get over the fact that Jesus loved him. Oh, wonder of all wonders, as we sign. Oh, wonder of all wonders. For a song of us remember an old chorus. I am so glad that Jesus loved me. And John is there. And Jesus turns and says to Mary, woman, behold your son. To John, behold your mother. From that hour the disciple took her to his own home. He lovingly entrusts his mother, the one who gave him the one who gave us a Savior. As the Holy Spirit conceived within her womb, God in human flesh, we see this loving and trusting. For they were not alone. We, we also read of the soldiers and if in Jesus' words to John we see his loving and trusting in the soldiers, we see an unwitting fulfillment. For them, they are simply participating in another three executions. It's interesting that John does not really make much of the other two men who were crucified with Jesus. The Holy Spirit, as he inspires the gospel writers, leaves that to Matthew and Mark and, and Luke to tell us more of these men. But the soldiers are there. And as they begin to 
divide up the garments. What a sad and sorry scene. These guys were probably the poorest of the poor. But what a tragic image. Dividing up the garments. And then their eyes light up on this robe, this undergarment, this seamless undergarment. And it's if they say, well, no, that's too good to, to just turn into rags. Well, let's cast the law. Did they not know that it was prophesied? That they divided my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. Nothing happening on Golgotha's hill that day was happening by mistake. It had been prophesied, it had been predicted by the Holy Spirit. And every unwitting action of the soldiers fulfills the prophecy. They come to break the legs of those who are being crucified. That, of course, would hasten their death. Any attempt they had to, to try and hold themselves, hold up their weight, to, to take something of the burden off their lungs would be gone as their legs were broken. And death would come quickly. Because they would die when their life ebbed away. But not so Jesus. Jesus died when he offered up his spirit. That's when Jesus died. So again, they, they come and in, instead of their customary pattern, it would seem of, of breaking the legs if they needed to hasten the death. No, he's dead already. Well, did you see that he truly was dead or, or we do not know, but one took a spear. And blood and water came forth. But again, and their unwitting actions, failing to realize that they were fulfilling the prophecy that said, Not one of his bones will be broken. And also they will look on him whom they have pierced. Our Savior. Even today in his glorified body, with pierced hands and a wound in his sight. The evidence that settled it for doubting Thomas. The evidence, friends, that reminds us there is a man in glory who still bears the image of a lamb that has been slain. It's our Savior. So if we found the unwitting fulfillment of these prophecies in the actions of the soldiers, what about the new boldness that is displayed by the secret disciples? We read of Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy, wealthy man. Yet yeah, there's a tragedy in what we read in these verses, for we read that he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly. Secretly. For fear of the Jews. I wonder what that looked like for Joseph. There are believers around our world who are believers in secret because they know that if they were to be public in their, in their profession of the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, it would mean imprisonment and death. Was this what lay behind Joseph's Secrecy. <coughs> Truth is, we truly can't tell. But something changed. The man who, as it were, had lived his life in terms of his admiration or his following of Jesus had lived it in the shadows, now comes into the daylight 
And with him comes another man from the shadows. A man called Nicodemus. Oh, again, there's so much conjecture as to why did Nicodemus come one night long ago? <laughs> as some of us learned in Sunday school. Was it simply because Jesus was busy during the day? Or was it because Nicodemus, a, a, a member of the Sanhedrin, that leading Jewish body, was it because Nicodemus had a wee bit of the Joseph in him as well, just a wee bit uncertain? Yeah, friends, when we come to the cross, there's no place for secret disciples. Instead, almost to borrow some of that language, the cross is a place where colours need to be nailed to the mast. How do we stand in relation to Jesus? Nicodemus, Joseph, they go, they bring that body. I doubt that could have been done secretly. People knew what they were doing and they were willing to take a stand. Dare I even say, friends, that same need is here today regarding our Saviour who died upon that cross. We do not simply admire him from a distance. We're called to be his disciples and take a stand for him. For having thought of Pilate and that intriguing inscription. Or John and his loving and trusting as Jesus gives Mary to him for him to care for and saying to both of them, women, behold your son and John, behold your mother, the soldiers. Is it to the soldiers perhaps specifically? That Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Unwittingly fulfilling all that had been promised. But finally, the Savior. Atonement. Accomplished. Oh, even in his final words upon the cross. There was fulfillment of prophecy. Other gospel writers record his words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A cry from the heart of the Saviour that I do not believe we will ever be able to plumb the depths of. Remember hearing a, a preacher by the name of Joel Beakey preach on that subject. He certainly plumbed the depths of that cry more than I think I had ever heard before in a message, but still the realization we will never understand what it meant for the sinless Son of God in those hours of separation. I still remember Joel Beakey, a man who a large part of his worship would involve the singing of psalms. I, I, was, I smiled in that service to hear him quoting from that old gospel hymn, the 90 and 9. He said these words. And none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed or how dark the night our Lord passed through ere he found the sheep that was lost. Will never plumb the depths, friends. Even in Jesus' words, it is finished. So much is said. Even before those words, I thirst. Again, the scriptures fulfilled. But in that word, finished. You know, verse 28 says, Jesus knowing that all was now finished. He knew. 
Can you imagine that? He knew why he had come to earth. In the eternal covenant between him and his father, a purpose to save a people from their sins, he came to earth to give himself. Even the anguish in the garden. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but, but yours be done. Jesus knew what that would entail. Yet he says, not my will, but yours be done. And now, now, it is finished. I've said this before, please think I, I bring you no new thing. It is finished. The words that would be taken and written across an invoice when payment had been received in full. Just one single Greek word, tetelestai, paid in full. On that cross, as Jesus died as we sing, the wrath of God was satisfied. Payment for our sins was made in full. And Jesus said, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That God would do that for you. That God would do that for me. That we might be redeemed. He has friends. That wonderful redemption that Christ accomplished on the cross. And is applied by the Spirit's work to the heart of everyone who believes. He finished the work. In order. That we might be redeemed. How good is our God. Our service this evening has been prepared in order that we might think upon our Savior, upon his sacrifice, that our eyes might be drawn to him. Yet he never intended that we would look, as it were, to, to statues or to crucifixes in order to remember our crucified Saviour. No. For on the night he was betrayed, he had taken bread. And said, this is how you will remember me. Bread, there would always be bread, whatever form it would take. Even the form of a simple wafer, there would always be bread. There would always be the fruit of the vine. There would always be that means in which to remember him as he ordained that we should. And therefore, friends, as our service comes to, to this focus this evening, as we prepare our hearts, we're we're going to keep our seats and sing together the first verse of Behold the Lamb, and then our brother Bill Cook will come and lead us in prayer. But first, verse 1, Behold the Lamb. <laughs>
But Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of the service, we we're reminded by reading your word that uh, it tells us of many of the the events leading up to the crucifixion. Father, we remember the betrayal by Judas, who, for the sake of a few silver coins, betrayed our Lord Jesus. We remember, Father, that he informed the soldiers of where and when they could find our Lord Jesus, and and they did, and they took him into, as it were, custody, where they took off his outer garment and called him the King of the Jews and set on his head a crown of thorns. Father, we remember on his way to the place of crucifixion, that long, long walk where he was asked to carry his own cross, where he was mocked and kicked and punched probably, spat upon, even the very hairs of his head and the face were being pulled out. A cross too heavy, he just couldn't carry it all the way, so Simon of Cyrene was asked, he just happened to be there and was asked to give assistance to the Lord. We remember, Father, that, that further to that he was asked to lay on the cross where these nails were inserted through his hands into the cross. These nails probably seven or eight inches long and excruciatingly painful. Remember, Father, when he was lifted up on that hill called Golgotha. We remember him in his agony uh, asking the Father to forgive, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And despite all the pain and suffering that he suffered, Father, we know that at any time he could have called 10,000 angels to lift him off the cross, to heal his wounds, to make him as he was. But no, Father, that was not good enough. He had to pay the price of our, our inequities, our but freedom from sin. Father, we, we love him so much for what he did in that cross and we can't even begin to imagine all that surrounded the cross and the love that was expelled by the, the Lord Jesus. And even at this time, Father, we as we turn our thoughts to the bread and the wine, we do this every week, Father. And sometimes during the day we remember his death as well without even taking the, the formal way to do it. So Father, as we think of the bread and wine, we, the bread speaks of the broken body, broken for us, Father, uh, just for us. And the wine speaks of that precious soul-cleansing blood which flowed so freely. Father, we give you thanks for all that it means to each one of us. And as we go now to take the bread and the wine, we do so, Father, in love and fellowship with each other, and we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. We say all these things, Father, in Jesus' lovely and precious name. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Before we come to share in the bread together, let us sing. The second verse of Behold the Lamb.
Jesus had gathered with his disciples to celebrate the Passover. We read that he took bread. And having given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together as we give thanks. Father, on this Good Friday service, we find ourselves still calling out, as we were singing earlier, Oh, make me understand it. Help me to take it in what it meant for you, the Holy One, to take away my sin. O oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we see clearly that all through Scripture, it is your love, that amazing love, that gave us that gift of the Lord Jesus. We read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Oh yes, Lord, we thank you that when we look at that old cross in our minds, Shining out from that cross is the golden truth that he is love. He loved sinners, and he so loved the world that he gave us, his Son. Oh, Father, we are just overcome with gratitude whenever we think, as Scripture says, here it is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation of our sins. No matter what way we look at that old rugged cross, dear Father, it's a declaration of love. Yes, the precious love, and it was precious, because it was the Son of God who came to sacrifice from God and for God. And as we watch the Lord Jesus on that cross, we can see he was our high priest offering the spotless sacrifice of himself as a satisfaction to God for the sins of all peoples. As scripture says in Hebrews, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Oh, thank you, Father, that we can now say we are redeemed. The ransom demanded by a holy God has been paid for in full. We have been made pure, cleansed and forgiven and sanctified, set apart for him. Yes, even brought near. No fear to draw near to that throne. We are welcome. Since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain that is his flesh. Oh, Father, help us to take it in. This precious, precious blood 
Of course, it was powerful blood because through that blood we're set free. Scriptures tell us whoever the Son sets free, they are free indeed. We're justified. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Father, as we sit at this table, tonight let us rejoice that now there is no condemnation, no accusation, and no separation. As Paul says, nothing in all things all these things are more, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers nor height, nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, the love of God. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Oh, Jesus, you told us to do this in remembrance of you. And as we take this cup, we pray that you will help us to remember that he left us that glorious promise. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Oh, Father, we pray. That in our hearts, as we allow you to speak to us by your Holy Spirit, even this night, may we know even a little more of that love of God in Christ Jesus. We come to receive of the cup, but as we do, let us sing together the third verse of Behold the Lamb. He's our crucified Savior. Yet, Father, in your will we will gather here in two days' time and proclaim Christ.
Christ the Lord is risen today for not only is he our crucified Savior, he is our risen Lord. And Father, those words that were placed upon the cross where Jesus died, the King of the Jews, Father, we are pleased to proclaim it our coming King. Yet until he comes, Father, until you send him for his bride is complete, until that day, may you find us faithful, walking as disciples, not secretly, but openly, that the world might know that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Stand with me as we bring our worship this evening to a close and singing the final verse of Behold the Lamb. says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all.